Hey everyone, welcome to episode 30 of the Sam Taylor Podcast. My name is Kay Schiff and I'm the producer. Today's conversation is with Nicole Bain, who is a recent successful CV writer, DAO grad, and current senior associate with KPMG. She joined Sam to discuss her education path to becoming a CPA, uh, from her DAO prep to the Queen's GDA program, uh, and she also shared her personal side, what it's like to be immediately forced into online school amidst graduating graduating DAO and going into Queens, and also working from home uh, while dealing with the challenges of a busy season at KPMG, uh, and then to, to sort of finding something new outside of work um, that can be a passion to fulfill and, and enjoy your time. She also shared a lot of great insight on how she structured her uh, CV summer. So if you're someone that is coming into that uh, time of year uh, for yourself, or if you're thinking about doing the CPA program and wondering what that's all about, uh, she provided a lot of great insight uh, for that. So if you're someone in that position, definitely check this out. I think you'll find a lot of value. Thanks and, and enjoy the episode. Good afternoon, Nicole Bain. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh gosh, my my pleasure. Uh, thank you for coming on. Um, before we get going, uh, my icebreaker question: Would you say you're a listener or a talker? Granted, I should have probably asked you this before um, <laughs> before I bullied you into this podcast. But would you say you're a listener or a talker? Perhaps a little bit of both. That's a good one. I think I can play either, but I think I'm more of a talker. I can get rambling. If you, yeah, I can I can talk for quite a while. I would say. Oh, see, I love, I love asking these questions because I, I literally was like, well, maybe she's more of a listener because I feel like in class, you are always a really good listener. I seem quiet, but if you get me going, like I will, I ha like, I love telling stories. I tell random details of my life to random people in the grocery store kind of thing. So I would, I think I'd have to go with talker on the, mm. yeah. Ooh, I like this. I would, <laughs> I would say that, um, since you graduated and we've stayed in touch, I have noticed you talking a lot more. So maybe it's just <laughs> that you didn't have a ton to say about consolidation. <laughs> didn't really, like, Tried to keep my mouth rambling. closed. Yeah, I didn't know what I was talking about. So I just didn't want to. <laughs> You're like, go water it. bottle, left hand, yeah. right hand, smush, <laughs> lemonade. <laughs> All right. Oh, so. <laughs> So it's good. Um, I, you can play both, um, but more, more of a talk, more of a rambler. I like that. Uh, so yeah, I kind of alluded to it a little bit, but how do we know each other? So yeah, as Sam said, we um, know each other from Dalhousie. I, uh, I went there for my undergrad. We met in third year was when sort of accounting your major starts and Sam taught. I was thinking about this before and my memory of our accounting courses are so smushed. Okay. I think cost was the first class in yes. third year. Um, and then from then on, I think we had about three or two more classes after that. Yeah. So, um, probably yeah. felt like three more after that, yeah. but it was two. <laughs> it was two so As it's I said, fun. yeah, it's all, it's such a blur. <laughs> it is a blur because then we had IFA two in the fall and AA two in the winter, but half, um, was yours. No, yours was, um, we, we, got, we got through most of it without the pandemic. And then it was right at the tail end um, yeah. that in your fourth year that we, we went online and, and finished up kind of abruptly. Yeah, too bad. I know. I, I, fortunately, not enough of our course material, I don't think, was left. So I think we sort of just finished where we were. Um, so we had like it was a good point in the semester to wrap up. Didn't yeah, too much. But in terms of saying goodbye to people and having closure, that was definitely, definitely hard. Um, yeah, actually, that's an interesting question. I'm kind of curious about this. So when we, um, some of your classes wrapped up right away, and then mine, we had just finished the really big test, the really big consolidation yeah. test. And then we were into segment reporting. I think we had just played a game. So we had just played the, yes. um, yeah, um, I, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> uh, like the, bingo, yeah. the Rogers communications bingo. It's okay. I, I kind of was trying to figure this out too. And then, so we would have had a um, basically not for profits left. And my question to you is because, you know, we'll, we'll circle back to this, but just to kind of jump to the end, uh, jump to more of the end, you did Queens, which put you, um, gave you core one, core two tax and insurance. And then, uh, the following year you did capstone one, capstone two, and this September you wrote the CP, which congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, so in, in that process, um, when we went online, you still had foreign currency translation and not-for-profit accounting, which we transitioned online, did some online lectures, did, I think, a take-home assignment um, at any point. And I, because I remember just, um, I'm like, nope, they're not. I'm like, it was on the it was on the fence where it was like, we could have just called it there, but I'm like, right. no foreign transactions, foreign currency translations. And I'm like, not for profit. I can't let them go to the CV yeah. or at like grad school without seeing this. So decent call wouldn't have mattered. No, it came up, it came up in capstone too. every, like not every, but definitely some cases had, um, foreign, foreign currency and, um, definitely a few not for profits. I don't, I, can't remember if it came up on the CP, the CP's blur, but it definitely came up and I'm happy that we'd already seen it at that point. So thank you. <laughs> okay. No, my, yeah, no, good my pleasure. I'm not trying to dig for compliments. I'm just, I, cause in the moment you're Curious. just like, shoot, these students have just had their world like rocked. And now I'm like, nope. <laughs> yeah, no. And like, you must learn. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and good thing because definitely I remember the not-for-profits that was a little bit more detailed um, and that it was really helpful um, when it came to studying and capstone too. Cool. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because you have a really great perspective. And one of the reasons why, um, many reasons I wanted to have you on here, but one of them is literally we have not, there's nothing for you to gain from talking to me and from talking to our students, right? Like you have recently um, passed in, in the CP and you just want to kind of provide your perspective and, and, you know, be compassionate because you were there not too long ago. Hey, okay? totally. Like it's been a whirlwind and it's crazy to think that it's all been within COVID that sort of all of this has happened. Right. Yeah, as yeah. you said, finishing up Dal, graduating, um, heading off to Queens, doing that graduate diploma, Capstone 1, Capstone 2, CFI, and we're still in lockdown. So it, it definitely is sort of like a quick, yeah, I'm, it's very recent. It's fresh in my mind, and I'm, I'm happy to share my experiences and, and whatnot. So when I say, um, I think I have a few, few things that I like to repeat, um, and one of them is learning is repeated exposure to same or similar material. So when you see something in Dell, and you might not see it for a year or two um, when it comes up in grad school or, um, or subsequently in capstones, um, did it feel like, what did it feel like to, to see that material again? Kind of like a light bulb. Like okay. you look at it on a question or whatever it is, and you can think back to, or sometimes the way that my, my mind works is I can see the textbook in my mind, or I could see your slides or remember you talking about it. And it was like a light bulb. Like, I remember Sam saying this, maybe I don't remember the specifics. It's been a while. I'll have to yeah, sort of look up, look it up and dive into it, but definitely, um, the, the recognition and sort of being able to recall that. And that helps so much rather than diving in, trying to figure out sort of the foundations of the, of the, um, topic or whatever it may be, you having given us that really strong foundation and a good understanding, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, really helped in studying and and recalling it. So that was that was really helpful. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> and I, I think what you kind of said, and I just really want to push that, is that it's not about remembering everything. Um, it, it's about like, okay, light bulb or, oh, okay. And it sounds like confidence. And then, okay, I know where to look. I know I can get in there. I've seen it before. I feel good about this. And yeah, it's not it's not like all of it is there because that that would be insane because we no, cover a yeah. lot of material down and then you cover a lot of material subsequent but it's like confidence what would you say to some students and I've, I've had this come up over the years where they weren't necessarily thinking about the CPA route but it wasn't because they weren't interested in doing accounting they were they were interested in doing an accounting role um, after graduation and they were accounting majors or were considering accounting majors but they, they had some self-doubt. They were like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I can get my degree in accounting. I can probably get my degree in accounting. But I think the CPA is like out of reach. I think that perhaps my skill set or, you know, just saying it plainly in student language, I'm not smart enough to become a CPA. What would you say to those students? Um, I'm going to say if you made it through Dell Accounting, you can do it. You are smart enough. You have the tools. You have the resources. Dell's accounting program I'm, whether you've, you're in it now or you've made it through, looking back, you know it's hard work. You put in the work, you put in the time, you were able to get through and show up and you having sort of that outlook and even those tools, as I said, to do that at Dow, the next, whether you do sort of the, the modules, core one, core two, whatever you may do, 
you have the tools to get through. It's a mindset. And if you are interested in doing accounting after, the only thing holding you back is yourself. And I think you would regret that for, I don't want to, I don't want to be dark, but potentially the rest of your life. If you did that on a decision of self-doubt, um, I would say, just go full out. You, you've, you've made it this far. It's so, it's so in reach for you that just keep going. You, you can do it hundred percent. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah. And the thing is, if the reason for you not doing it is self-doubt, throw that away. Exactly. There's other reasons. Yeah. If you don't love accounting and you don't find it interesting, you can't see yourself in a role. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Maybe don't put yourself through because it it is time consuming effort. If you hate accounting and you're like, I'm only doing like, why am I doing this? I don't see passion. You don't see yourself. I maybe not. And that's totally fine. It's not everyone's path. And as I said, it is time consuming, but if you're the only reason that you wouldn't be doing it is because you don't have the confidence throw that away. And yeah, no, (laughs) no, no. Yeah. Yeah. And I would even say if you're unsure, but you're like, oh, well, um, so (laughs) I'll say for me, I wasn't quite sure there was nothing pulling me somewhere else. And so I was like, well, I don't know. It's like a relatively short time commitment if you're willing. And if you don't even use it for the rest of your life, it's kind of what I, I would put on there is if like, you're not like, if you're like, oh, I like accounting, but you're like, I can't see myself in an accounting role for the rest of my life. I'd be like, it's okay. Like there's so many things that you can use this degree for. You can right. use it to be an accountant or you can use it to like quote pivot. Um, you know, we have some of our former students who just recently got their CPAs and will be going and pursuing a marketing degree. So like a marketer, awesome. marketing exec with number knowledge. Yeah. Any accounting knowledge is so valuable in the business world. Like you can understand the entire company. You know what's going on. It is, it's so valuable. And yeah, as you said, you don't need to stay in accounting, CPA or just accounting in general, the door like opens so, so many other opportunities for you. So yeah, it's, it is really valuable and interesting how so many paths can sort of um, pop up for you or you can divert and change whenever you want. Yeah. So yeah. Well, so I I do want to delve into the point when you said is you did your entire grad school CPA studying um, and probably a lot of your work experience during that point um, (laughs) in in the middle of or start and middle and who knows, I'm going to optimistically say middle of COVID. Yeah. Um, Tell me about that. Like, tell me, bring me through how the summer was. So you wrapped up Adele, like sort of mid-March, sort of... um, end of April, uh, like how it normally would be. And then what did your months and days look like? Um, well, when classes ended in March and sort of pandemic was starting, everyone, no one knew what was going on. There was sort of a lot of panic. Um, all I knew, I was not ready to leave Halifax or, or whatever. My cl- I didn't have closure. I was not ready. So I stayed put in Halifax for, I think, an extra month. I think classes had ended at this at that point. We were kind of just um, hanging around, going around Halifax. It was pretty eerie. No one was around. Um, and then I guess preparing for my GDA. Once I got home, uh, I from Toronto, um, then classes started in May. Everything was completely online. Um, the whole time that was interesting because we sort of had, that was sort of my first like zoom classes. Here's your schedule. Cause as I said, Dal just sort of, we sort of ended. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely interesting. Um, I'm trying to think if anything, the, the biggest thing that I have found with remote working that I love is, um, I have a boyfriend in Calgary. So with all of this sort of remote learning, it's allowed me to, uh, get up and travel a lot. So during that GDA summer, I think I spent a few weeks in Calgary as well. Um, I know there are other people who were living in Vancouver or whatever, everyone's time zones were all over the place. So it was kind of interesting to see that everyone was doing their own thing in their own lives. But at the end of the day, we're sort of all on the same page on our zoom, whatever time it may be for you. Um, that was kind of an interesting thing that sort of brought people together. Just and in then, digging into that, how did yeah. you manage your time with that? So, you know, having, uh, I'm going to just say it, having a life and doing grad school, right? Because you were there visiting your boyfriend and then, um, you know, moving back and forth or doing school while having a life. Like, how did that look? Was that Um, doable? hundred percent. Yeah, it wasn't. I, I don't think I ever felt overwhelmed, whether that was being prepared from Dal. And the one thing I will say about, um, the GDA program that I went through, we had almost done every single course through Dal already. 
the tax program or the tax class that they do, DAL covers that in tax one and two. So we had already done every single thing in that course. There was a, a case writing course. We had already done a case writing course for an entire year. So we were completely prepared. Um, audit, we had a great audit course from our third year. So we were so well equipped that I think because of that, it was a little bit more um, less strenuous because we had already done the work. We didn't need to spend sort of hours and hours studying. Um, I, I just want to say like, yeah. thank you for saying that because I had, um, when we went back in person in the fall, I had some students and, um, one of them kind of got, um, I say got enough courage. Cause after she asked it, she was like, Oh no. Um, she was <laughs> like, well, like, uh, we were thinking about going to schools, like grad schools in, um, Ontario, but we're nervous because, you know, with U of T or with Queens, like they first accept like their students. And then they only accept a few of like us like students from away. And we're just not sure if our skill set will match like the people that already went to school at that school. The people who already went to school at that school, this is their first time seeing any of those courses, um, just the way that their programs are set up. I know Western and Queens, they sort of don't really dive um, into sort of the, the core core accounting courses. Um, whereas Dal, we get a deep, deep dive and we already know everything. So that was really, really comforting. And I will say, um, if you're going that path of sort of the GDA, the, the graduate diploma route, know that you are so well equipped and just be thankful for Dell. I know it seems sort of hard at the time where it's like, we have so many of these courses they are so intense. Like it gets frustrating sometimes because you feel, um, or not fresh. Well, you may feel no, I, I get doing it. more it's, work yeah, than others. It's hard. And like it's in third and fourth year, like you start second lot. semester because of the way the co-op is. Yep. You start second semester, third year, you have a bit of a summer where you're working and then fourth year is full on three and three. So yeah, yeah. it can be frustrating because it's, it's like, oh my gosh. But it pays off. As I said, I, we cruise through the, I say we, because I had a few other friends um, from Dal in this program as well. And we cruised through that summer. So me managing my life on top of that was, it was awesome. And that was sort of the first time um, seeing remote learning with your life. And I do actually like it because it does sort of take away that aspect of commuting or whatever it may be. You close your laptop. Okay. I either want to sit and work on this assignment, pump it up, pump it out in an hour and then do my stuff or whatever it may be. I just found there's a little extra more time um, when you are sort of stationed in, in one place. So um, yeah, that was sort of how my, my GDA summer went and how I, I managed and how Dow helped so, so much. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, no, I should say after this, like check is in the mail, but no, it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's one of my, one of the reasons why I came to Dow is because I knew that we had a super strong accounting team and that 90% um, of the grads went to the CPA program. And when I was teaching CPA, I was so frustrated because, um, you know, no shade, but just a lot of the universities don't have profs that are also working in the CPA program. So it's really hard to get that perspective. Um, and, you know, perhaps they have really good research programs or, you know, they have other strengths and really good things to offer. But I would have these students who were like, you know, self-proclaimed like A, A plus students who would come to CPA and be really frustrated and be like, my skill set's not trans, essentially like they're like, my skill set's right. not translating or like, I was really good. Now I'm not. And then they just start doing more hours and more hours because that's what they did in university. They just started yeah. throwing hours at it. And I'm like, yo, it, like I actually would take somebody who's a, like less smart, who's just like coachable, <laughs> like less smart, like who has less technical knowledge. And, but it's coachable. And like, cause part of the CPA game is like enough of enough. So yes, you need to have that skill set, but you need to apply it. And if you spend a hundred hours writing a one hour case, that's not going to help you pass the no. five hour, four hour, <laughs> or sorry, a four hour, five hour, four hour uh, right. CP. So yeah. And another thing I'm grateful for Dal is I get, yeah, that was in fourth year, I think second semester that we did our course with Tammy, advanced yeah. accounting one. A -A one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and for people who don't know, that is sort of a deep dive starting in case writing specifically um, with the CPA way and basically studying, for, not studying for the CPA, but learning how to write a CPA case and learning how mm -hmm. to tackle that. And I remember that, I think at that point, that was the most challenging course that we'd ever been through. And as you said, sort of that mindset of we're used to getting good marks because we study, we put the hours in and coming into this, this class, writing these cases and getting absolutely destroyed with such a confidence knockdown that we were all so upset, struggling. We were kind of like, how are we going to get through this? Um, but 
looking back on that and and as we went through we obviously learned um how to get better and we did sort of learn how to write a case really well um but just that mindset change i'm so happy that we learned that early on um because even in the queen's gda pro program as i said there was a case writing course but i don't think people even wrapped their heads around it there because we only i want to say we only wrote about three or four cases maybe it wasn't wasn't too many so people didn't quite and it was online so you can yeah there's an answer key right people weren't necessarily doing it full out um whereas in person okay everyone pencils down do the best that you can and then figure it out from there that learning that on early on was game change game changer so that by the time cp summer came cases were not new you maybe you weren't doing amazing yet but you knew sort of how to structure it and then you had time to sort of work on that technical and and whatnot so that having that course in the dial program oh every course in the dial program is so well thought oh, no. out i think this is so super important to hear because yeah. um those students have just opened up their syllabi this this week and um course, you know, yeah. for, i know i know <laughs> um I had something due on Thursday and people were like, how could you make something due in the first week? Um, they didn't quite say yeah. it like that, but I'm like, because this whole semester is hard, like, it's you know, hard. Yeah. If ever, it's whenever hard. we push back, like it, it doesn't go, it doesn't go away. So no. with Tammy's course, you know, when they um, see AA1 and they see, or, and they start experiencing the same feelings that you're experiencing it's really good that we're recording this now so they can be like wait I Gets did better. semester one <laughs> I'm in semester yeah. two Nicole said <laughs> that I can do it like yeah we're, we're normal this is normal yeah everyone feels the same way you being like I know nothing like what is this I can't write this first of all that's not true because you will learn and you will get it but second of all everyone is feeling that way this is a completely new way to approach cases that you've ever written before um and the way that the, the sort of course is set up you will get there and you will learn trust the trust the process i think i'll leave it up there trust the process i like that um so you mentioned one other thing on there and you said everybody is feeling the same way and when yes we work together in cost um is it fair to say that cost in IFA 2, Intermediate Financial Accounting 2, are pretty different courses? <laughs> yes. Yes, <Yeah>. they are. <laughs> well, okay. Not just because like one's managerial, managerial accounting right. um, and one is, you know, financial reporting, um, but, you know, a lot of costs, correct me if I'm wrong, um, tends to be like what you've already seen in 1102 in, um, in intro, um, but then beefed up and applied. Whereas the stuff that you're seeing in IFA two is the liabilities and equity side of the balance sheet or, yeah. and, um, and each week is like a deep dive into a topic yeah. until it, and it keeps going and going, 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 going until it stops. Yeah. Okay. So when you yes, said, how that. are you feeling? <laughs> yeah. um, how, how did you feel at the beginning of that course? Of IFA two? IFA two. Um, overwhelmed, I think seeing the syllabus, as you said, a new topic every week, and those topics were deep dives. Um, it was a little overwhelming, sort of, I think the tests start pretty soon. And that's sort of, as those of you in accounting, you know, it sucks. Everyone, your friends in the first few weeks are still going out and you have a midterm either the second or third week. And that's just sort of how it is. Um, but yeah, having all that material thrown at once was a little bit overwhelming. I will say, I think it did take me the first midterm to sort of figure out how to study it, how to digest it, because as I said, there's a lot of material. It's hard to pinpoint or focus in on what exactly is important, how to apply that um, in a question. I sort of forget how the questions are, are posed, but figuring out how to get all that information down. Um, as I said, I, I didn't do amazing on that, on that first one, but I think we had a few other tests left that I sort of went into full gear um, I think it's in first semester. So I was still sort of trying to keep my marks up to, to head into grad school. So, um, having, not doing so well in my first one gave me sort of that 110% motivation to just absolutely crush the next one. I can't even picture what I did exactly other than just sort of having that drive and motivation to know that I, I needed, and I wanted to, um, crush the next one. So whether that meant I just spent every day I, I debriefed your class or I went over the notes or I um, recorded what you said in class, whatever it was, I, I can't remember specific tips. No, I, 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 so I feel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like, and can I use numbers? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you got like a 73 or 76, somewhere right around average. Yeah. For the not, first test. not bad in any sense, but I'm but a you pretty- booked, you yeah. booked Calendly office hours. Yes. <laughs> and you are not happy with yourself. Is that, yes. that's fair. Yeah. And then we talked about what did you do to study for that? And then what do you think you could study? How do you think right. you could study differently? And, you know, yeah, we use numbers. I just use numbers to put into context because I had a lot of very similar numbers and similar feelings this term. And so you are definitely not alone. And, and I, I do want to take a brief pause right there. Um, how do I do you want to do this? Because when, what I saw that was so unique, you mentioned your friend group uh, going to grad school, but you also had the same friend group or similar friend group in that course, um, in that uh, throughout your undergrad. Right. And you would say, you would ask everybody, like each other after a big test or after a test, something that I found was so unique. Um, when you got results back, did you ask them how, how they did? So what we did as a friend group, we would typically ask how you felt, how did it go? How do you feel rather than sort of being like, oh, what'd you get? Because in commerce and accounting, you don't need that extra sort of layer of comparison. It's a competitive environment. You don't need to have something to make you feel shit about yourself or whatever having numbers to compare where everyone's level of success is so different so that was so irrelevant to us um and because we were so close as sort of um, a study group a friend group whatever we didn't need that extra level of comparison or competition within each other that we didn't feel that that was important if you did your hardest you uh put your pen to your paper you felt you crushed it if you said amazing that like I felt really good, then that's all that mattered to us. Or if you, if you didn't feel it felt it went well or whatever, then of course we are there for emotional support, but sort of taking that element out of numbers and comparing it's so it's not going to get you anywhere. It's just going to either make you feel like shit or what make yourself feel better for three seconds, but you're realizing you're putting your friend down. Yeah. Right. So it's so not worth it. Um, I do recommend that strategy of people sort of have friends in the program or whatnot stop, don't ask numbers. It doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. Um, what, what their number is to them could be a completely different number to you. So if you just ask how they felt or whatever, I felt that was a much more healthy approach. Um, and just sort of checking in and making sure everyone, um, is doing okay. And, or if you're there to celebrate their success for them. Um, yeah, that was sort of our approach. I first time I'd ever seen or heard that. And I just, I loved it. And I wish, I wish that I would have either thought to ask somebody that when I was a student or, you know, thought to ask that before as, as a prof. And mm -hmm. the one thing I try to never do is, um, you know, I love it when people come to my office hours and try to debrief tests when they got, you know, 97% or when they got 7%, you know, right? it's like, Hey, yeah. let's treat this, let's treat this the same. Cause I don't know. But right. as a student, I really wish that I would have had that, you know, that wherewithal to kind of ask. Um, and mm -hmm. if somebody said, asked me a question, like if somebody was like, oh, how did you do? I'd be like, I feel good about this, or I don't feel good. And kind of turning that into, into the relative um, feelings, because that's what it is. I don't want somebody to feel better or worse. I don't no. want to feel better or worse just because of, yeah, um, a number that really doesn't, in the big scheme of things, it really doesn't mean anything. Means and in nothing. the short term, like you said, three seconds, woohoo. Yeah. And so if you, if you are finding, cause I found sometimes other peers or people in the class would still ask, oh, what'd you get? I found the confidence to be like, I'm not comfortable telling you that, or I, you know, yeah. what, like it went well or tell them how I felt. If people, if you find people are still asking you and you're not comfortable, you don't like the feeling of when people ask you, you don't have to say it means nothing. Guess what? They're going to forget about in three seconds. Um, yeah. And yeah, just, I say, stick up for yourself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. So you came to my office. You were not yeah, happy sure. with your performance. No, no, this is great. Um, <laughs> linear is overdone in, in all the elements. Um, and then you, you know, we game played some things. We tailored it to your, your interests, your goals. Um, you came back and I'm pretty sure you got hundred <laughs> percent on the second one. If not a hundred, like dang, it may be including the bonus mark, but like you came back. Um, and so how did that feel knowing that you did that, knowing that you took ownership, you had the uncomfortable conversations and that you were able to put your hard work and just, you know, tweak it a little bit. Um, I think that was probably one of the best feelings I had in undergrad. Um, and as we said, no numbers being like in mind, going from somewhere that I 
wasn't happy with to going to something better than I could ever imagine was just sort of, and knowing that I did that in a few short weeks, however, however long the tests were yeah, like three, spread four, apart, not, not long. No. So that was a really incredible feeling. And I think that sort of proved to myself, if anything, that I can do it. I'm strong enough. I have the ability. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really a mindset shift from there on out that I knew I could do it. And I just needed to, um, find what worked take the time, whatever it may be, come see you. Uh, yeah, as I said, read the notes, but definitely having that mindset that I can do this um, really helped me sort of throughout and on the rest of my, my whole sort of accounting um, journey. Fabulous. And um, are you, are you special? Is this something that only you could do? No, no other. No. Doubts, oh my goodness. I, like you have the capability, as I said, it's a mindset shift. If you want something, you switch your mind and to, to determining that you want that and you're you're on the path you can you can do anything you set your mind to nice all right so you finished queen's gda and then um at this point did you have a job to go to after um after your gda summer yeah so thankfully again with dal co-ops i did all my co-ops at kpmg in toronto um, and the great thing was sort of being at the same place that you have, they often um, offer you a job pretty early on. So I think I knew after my third co-op. So that was sort of nice to have um, that job yeah. security. So I started virtually October 2020. Um, and again, I can't stay away from Halifax. I actually lived in Halifax for um, sort of like a, a school year. I lived in a student house with some, with some friends and just uh, worked remotely for the year. So that was an incredible perk of work from home, sort of gave me that element um, as I was sort of still navigating through the pandemic. I love my family, work, uh, living at home is I'm so grateful, but at the same time, I'm someone who sort of needs that social aspect. So removing myself and, and being in Halifax and still with sort of friends and stuff, that was really what I needed. Um, so I'm really grateful for that experience. Work, work new, but it made no difference, as I said, everyone's on their computer at the same time, wherever you may be. That's kind of the, the beauty of, of work from home. Um, so well, yeah. And they didn't exactly take it easy on you either. Right. So <laughs> you are experienced coming back and don't worry, we'll, we'll stay, stay on the surface, but yeah. um, you, you, they know what kind of awesome worker you are. It's not like being in a location, you know, are you working from this bedroom or that bedroom? Right. Like your results will stand for itself. But, um, you know, circumstances were such that you were actually senioring or, you know, doing some very like technical and supervision roles um, for your, for your position really early on. Okay. Oh, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah. So um, I'll just kind of paint the picture a little bit more. So you are remote in Halifax, returning as an experienced associate and um, sorry, my and, home phone. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. I had a barking dog earlier. I was doing the same thing. Um, and so they didn't exactly take it easy on you. How did you feel um, being challenged working remotely in a pandemic? Um, yeah, that was a really, really tough situation. As Sam said, I sort of was kind of thrown into this situation. Um, yes, I was experienced, but not to the level that they sort of threw me in um, as a senior. And uh, I audit bank, so our year end is, is October 31st. So my first mm. day would have been October 5th and they have me on this file a week after my training. So a lot was thrown at me at once. Um, it was extremely overwhelming. I My biggest sort of lesson I learned from that, which I, I guess I'll share is sort of is to speak up for yourself because as I said, I, I was drowning. It was not a normal situation. I shouldn't have been put in it in the first place. It was inappropriate. I had no help, no senior or it. Like even my manager wasn't even really there. So it was an inappropriate position for me to be in and for me to just continue to struggle and not say anything, the, the audit wouldn't have gotten done. And who who's that good for? Like that's yeah. worst case scenario. So learning to sort of speak up um, when you have a gut feeling that this isn't right. It's not that you're complaining. You know that this isn't right. You need more resources. You need whatever. Always speak up. Um, if anyone is in a similar situation, I went sort of directly to oh. my performance manager and then they sort of took it up to the people leaders in our group and they, they were able to find sort of extra help um, to come in. And even when they found sort of a senior to come in, she was like, I don't know how you were doing this. Like, this is 
ridiculous. So if I let it go on any longer, I'm not quite sure what would happen. But as I said, biggest lesson is speak up for yourself. And since then, sort of in my audit journey, you'll find you get thrown into sort of many different situations, usually because of staffing or, or whatever it may be, but don't feel afraid to speak up. It's only going to hurt you if you stay silent. Um, and at the end of the day, you're the only one who's going to advocate for yourself and you, you have to do what's right for you. So definitely don't yeah. be afraid to speak up. I'm going to advocate for, um, like play devil's advocate a little bit because from KPMG's point of view, they're like, man, we got the goal. Like she yeah. has, um, you know, this entire history, she's been with the company for a bit. Um, and then, you know, somewhere along the journey, perhaps there was an extra person, perhaps there was some scheduling stuff. And then some of that falls away and they, like as an employer, and I've definitely been guilty with this too on teams is if I don't set reminders for myself to check up and, you know, not just ask people how they're doing, but kind of like find tests and find ways to see how they're doing. Right. Um, I tend to think sometimes no news is good news. So, you know, the fact that part of that, you know, environment is, you know, relying on your awesome employees to say, Hey, listen, um, I, I need help. Like this isn't, yeah. this isn't appropriate. Like give me some resources. And at that point, like an awesome employer is like, okay, hey, let's, let's figure this out because yeah. like you are on the same team. Like you want this audit to be, <laughs> you want this audit to be done and you want exactly. it to be done like appropriately and like in, and everything. So I think that that is, is really good. And it's not, you know, it's not bad on you for saying something. It's not necessarily bad on them. Although, you know, as, as, as a company, <laughs> yeah. I will say though, it has been the case with every big four that I've talked to or worked in or, or anything. And in fact, I just listened to a podcast with Jocko Willink and he actually said that the, uh, the Navy SEALs is designed to be exactly that way in the sense that they would put you into a position that you were like, um, not yet quite ready for, but they knew that you could do, but right. not quite. And then just as you were like, oh, I got this, they would, put <laughs> yeah bump you up again. Um, yep. Yep. So, Welcome to public accounting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So we, then you do your year and you stay in Halifax, um, for that year. And I actually don't know the answer. Um, I perhaps do. Um, and throughout this, you were working. Um, I stayed in touch cause I, I know your, your boyfriend. So, and I had worked with him, um, the, the previous summer. And so I kind of would hear some updates about you and I'm like, oh yeah, like God, Nicole's doing, <laughs> doing good, like working hard for being challenged, like doing good. And then, um, when did you go on, I, I believe you took a break for capstone two, but not capstone one. So first let's go to capstone one. How was it doing work in capstone one? Luckily in the way that sort of, um, my audit practice I'm in summers are off time. So sort of like a normal nine to five. Um, so I had my evenings and my weekends to do capstone. Um, I was really fortunate with my capstone group. It was five members and four out of five of us were from KPMG. So we sort of had that public accounting background, um, and similar work ethics, which was really, um, special and really helped a lot. And timing, dynamic. you could probably like your yeah. schedules, you were busy at the same times and less busy at other. Exactly. So that I was, I was really fortunate, um, for that, for my group. Um, so as I said, I, I was able to manage it because I had, um, evenings and weekends to, to work on it. And we, we split up the, the work evenly. So, um, coming from accounting, like in, in university, when you've exams and you're studying is all day, you yeah. know how to time manage. So I found, um, that that was totally doable uh while working so um that's yeah, great because no, that sometimes yeah. people are like we have um we have this uh you know capstone one and even before the pandemic like it's you have one in-person workshop or which would have been virtual then mm -hmm. um but traditionally you'd have one per in-person workshop and then you would spend eight weeks online and get a couple of zoom calls in with your facilitator, but then do an in-person workshop. So it sounds like the only thing that kind of changed was the workshop at the beginning. And then the presentation at the end was now virtual, but exactly. otherwise everything was still virtual. So it felt like probably relatively doable with work. You just had, you know, um, your graduate diploma, um, virtual, you were just working for your virtual and now you're like, cool, a little bit more virtual, even though it's a group work, it sounds like that was, that was very doable. Exactly. Yeah. And, and everyone's done group projects in the past, Google docs, whatever it may be, you sort of know how to collaborate and organize. So 
you've, you've been in this situation before. It's, it's no different. Um, the case, the case is a little hefty, but you have, I think eight weeks or however long to go yeah. through it. As long as you time manage, um, it's, it's definitely doable. Fabulous. Yeah. Okay. So then that went, I believe you have like presentation. So capstone one's like beginning of May and then to like eight weeks later. So end of June. Yeah. And then capstone two starts in like, like and July 17th yeah. ish, like two thirds yeah. of the way through. Um, did you do anything between capstone one and capstone two? I took time off. And Woo! if you have, yes! if you have the opportunity, um, any of those who sort of are at a public, um, accounting firm and do get study leave, um, you sort of use your, your vacation time and then unpaid time. I threw in another, um, extra unpaid week in between, just because I knew mentally it's, a, it is a lot. You are about to dive into a big process. Don't feel guilty for taking the time. If you are able to sort of with, with how work permits. And if you, if you don't have, um, any commitments or whatever, I would take the time off just to give yourself that mental break. Um, give yourself something to look forward to and then sort of mentally reset before you really sit down and are studying for the rest of the summer. Um, I went out west with a couple girlfriends. We went camping in Jasper. I spent some time in Calgary, went to the Calgary Stampede. Um, so lots of like nice fun, which was good just to sort of break up all of the, the work that was had happened and was, was about to come up. So um, if you can, I recommend taking the time off before. And then also I'm sure you've heard, um, and you should do this as well, is take time after the CP mm. um, and don't feel guilty. There's, right, there's, it's your time. As I said, you need to advocate for yourself. If you know that you need a mental break, then you take the time for yourself. No one's judging, Just, yeah. <clears throat> yes. Um, and I love that you are giving permission, um, because I'm taking notes for myself because sometimes, yeah. <laughs> uh, sometimes you get caught up in the, like the just work, 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 and then the break becomes the hard part and it shouldn't be like the, no. they should both be both good and rewarding, both the work and, and the breaks. Right. So I'm glad you're and reminding. Some, yes. Yes, for sure. Um, and then I headed into capstone yeah. as we said, July, everything was online, um, had a good did you have a study group? Did you like swap papers? So yes, you had a study group. Yeah. Um, KPMG sort of, we had a really good boot camp, and then we had our study groups from there, um, which are my good friends from work. So that was, that was really fun. And um, yeah, we had a good routine of sort of when we'd log on in the morning, write our cases, mark cases, swap cases between each other. Um, yeah, sort of got into a What group. did a typical day look like and what did a typical week look like so for example when you say you logged on in the morning what time was that at um I prefer to be in a routine I'm not a huge morning person but I believe we'd aim to be on at around nine anyways just so you can have the rest of your evening it's the summer it's nice out you want to have plans there's no point in sort of delaying the morning so we came on I think at nine um let's say if there was a case that day um we would write case in the morning, maybe take a break, um, swap cases, mark for, I think, double, uh, I can't even remember, however long you are to mark a case, and then take it on to our own debrief for double the time. That's sort of when you review your technical, and then that was sort of like a typical day. And then sometimes you'd end early, sometimes it would go a little longer. Um, so what was the aim, like, to kind of log off? What would be, like, if you were, like, earlier than that time would have been early or later than that time would have been late? I would say around 4.30 was probably the normal. Early, sometimes it could be like 3.45, 3. That was a yeah. great, that was awesome. Yeah. You know, you did what you you had. There's no point in sort of staying on and, and burning out. Um, late would honestly be any time after five. And we tried, me and my friends were really good. Um, even if we wanted to, and we, if we felt the need and we were on a roll and, and we weren't pushing ourselves, we were sort of diving into the material, feeling good. Sure. Go on like a few extra minutes, but no, no yeah. pushing after 5. PM. Yeah. No pushing. No, like, I just need to get this in. Cause yeah. at that point you're not necessarily thinking clearly. You're like, I need to get it in. And it's like, yeah. if I just put this aside and show up tomorrow, it's like 10 minutes. But if exactly. I try to push through this, it's an hour. Exactly. So that's good to, to recognize it. Um, and what, do, would you have like an hour break for lunch? Like, what did your breaks look like? I think we had an hour break for lunch. Um, try and throw in, as I said, it's it's flexible. You're the one making yeah. the, the study schedule. I would say probably um, it would be go case, maybe break, mark, yeah. lunch, and then debrief all afternoon maybe. And then throw yeah. in like a 
coffee break in there or something. Yeah. And when you're debriefing, it's like, okay, how did I do? How could I get to the next level? So the mental kind of, um, energy is definitely more writing the case. And then, yeah. because you're just like plowing through, it's time constrained. You're trying to get um, it all in. Yeah. <laughs> and then you kind of take a break and you're like, Hey, then you mark. And that's like detailed. And you're kind of like, okay, how did this do? Maybe you're asking some questions. Like what is this right? Maybe you're flipping through some documents. And then when you're debriefing, you're really trying to say, okay, I was at an RC or I was at an NC. How do I get to the next level? How do I get to that RC from an NC? How do I get to a C from an RC? And so like small incremental improvements, you're you said, going back to your technical. So at the same time, like, okay, how did I, what did I need a little bit more? Was it my technical that was lacking? Was it my time management? And so the afternoons, while it might sound like a long time, you know, one to four, one to like four 30 or one to three, it's actually probably goes by relatively quickly. hundred percent social and it's applied. Yes. And you're the one putting in the effort, you know, that you you're on this journey, you want to pass the C fee. So that is where you do the most learning. So I found that sort of, it was no problem to put in that effort because a self-motivating person knows you want to get to the next level. How can I do that? How can I make sure that I learn the most that I can uh, today after writing this case that I can do even better tomorrow or just keep learning and keep yeah. leveling up. So I think being in the program in general, having that sort of um, self-motivating factor, you'll find the effort just comes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. And that it's just yeah. like that little bit more, a little bit more like yeah. day by day, self-motivating push. And then um, were you studying like this kind of nine to four thirty ish? Was it um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or what did it look like? You need to take days off. They, um, whether you're sort of doing your own studying or if you're in a program through work, or whatever, you need to take days off. Weekends off are a must. Um, I think one time we had a Saturday because they sort of did a mock um, CFI. We might have done a case Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but then we got the Sunday, Monday. Like you always yeah. need consecutive days off to um, break and rest. And even after my 5 p.m. Um, cutoff times. The great thing with school and sort of studying and whatever, um, unlike work, you can, you can close it, close the book, leave it and return later rather than sort of thinking about what do I need to do? These emails, whatever, do not think about it past, um, 5 PM or the weekends or whatever it may be. Take your time off to live your life outside of, um, work and, or sorry, not work. Um, it feels like work. Yeah. Cause you treat it like a job. Exactly. Exactly. You do treat it like a job. So taking time for yourself to um, sort of give you motivating things to look forward to, resting time, whatever it may be, you really need that extra time to push you through the long days and um, yeah, mental exhaustion. <laughs> so what did you do? And yes, I'm going to, I set up controls for myself. So, cause I knew that I would want to talk accounting outside of accounting, not like want to, but just feel like I had to. Right. So the controls that I set up is I would either go play poker. I would go um, uh, to hot yoga. I would go, um, you know, schedule drinks or you know, coffees with non-accounting friends. Yeah. Because nobody at yoga, poker, or my non-accounting friends wanted to hear about accounting. So, like, even if I tried, it, it would be a no-go. What about right. you? Um, I went to a lot of spin classes. It's helpful that it's in the summer because there are so many more activities that you can do and take advantage of. Um, a lot of time outside. Yeah. Drinks as well. Um, when I did see my accounting girlfriends, we just, it was an unspoken rule. There's no point in talking about this. We're stressed. Why would we like, so we just, it wasn't a topic of conversation. Um, luckily, but I'm trying to think what else I did. I'd spent another chunk of the summer out in Calgary. Um, as you can tell, I, (laughs) I'm out there quite a bit, but, um, Let's yeah, make town. So yeah. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, of course. Like Calgary Stampede, Canmore, yeah. and just 17th Avenue, 4th Street. Exactly. Yeah, there's yeah. Lots, of, lots of fun things to do there. Um, but yeah, those were, I think, I did a lot of paint by numbers. That's sort of my pandemic mm. activity that I like to go to. Um, reading okay. some Netflix. Yeah. No, it's good. I almost um, had like a list just so that I wouldn't, Remind I, again, because you, it, it's, it's normal if you care about something we, even though like hopefully through university and, or hopefully throughout points of it, you're like, okay, more is not more, but yet in your brain of wanting it so bad, you kind of have to set up those, like those little things like, okay, yeah. I already pre-booked spin, can't get out of that. Like, gotta go. And then you're not going to be thinking about accounting like exactly. 10 minutes in, <laughs> like 
like you're not exactly. gonna be on a tempo track being like oh. <laughs> how did my kids go today yeah <laughs> okay fabulous all right so um we actually covered a lot with um what do you like to do for fun during the cp summer now that you have written and passed the cp uh and you we are heading into oh gosh you would have just finished your other busy season for for the bank okay we did yes oh, <laughs> we made it through it's okay <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> thank you for answering my <laughs> emails during all of that. So funny. Of course. Um, are there any, like, have, what have you done with kind of, uh, maybe it hasn't even been long enough, but have there been any other hobbies or any kind of things that you're thinking or looking forward uh, towards, or like, what's going to take up this study time? Because you have been a perpetual, like a student for basically all of your life. Right. No, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, unfortunately, as you said, me coming out of that sort of my, my busy season before, oh, yeah. I haven't had too much time to um, adjust out of that yet. It took me a while to sort of, when you're working that much and you sort of don't have time for yourself, it, it took me a little bit to sort of get back into even what do I like to do in my free time? What did yeah. I used to do if I don't finish at 11 p.m. sort of thing? So yeah. it's taken me a little to sort of get back into a routine um, but definitely getting more consistent at working out because I know I like to move my body, especially with lockdown. It's really important to get outside and try and yeah, get outside when you can do walks, um, move your body. I've been picking up a lot of reading because I'm trying to reduce my screen time um, sort of thing with with lockdown when you're not seeing people, you're scrolling on your phone or whatever. I, I don't really like that habit for myself. So I'm trying to move towards reading a lot more. Are you looking at more like fiction or nonfiction or a mix? I like to do a mix. I like to try and do nonfiction in the morning and then fiction at night because I love a good, yeah, fiction before bed kind of yes. story. Fabulous. Um, um, yeah, those are sort of my my main, I guess, hobbies that I'm, I'm diving back into now after neglecting them for a while. You know, um, I like when I, I heard this advice because I have really been quote bad, except it's worked for me. So I wouldn't say it's bad, but it's bad by traditional um, standards about balance. Um, but if you look at balance, not in the terms of days, say, you know, working 16 hours, you know, for, you know, a couple months and then, right. you know, working two to three hours for a couple months or, you know, or whatever the life lifestyle of an academic or always working, but not working or like working at different right. pieces. Um, for myself, I look at balance and I try to look at it for a year. Like, am I doing, what have I done like this year? Have I had enough fun this year? Have I, and enough is by my standards, not by somebody okay. else's standards. It's like, have I had enough fun? Have I accomplished what I want to? Um, and if not, why? And, um, you know, were my goals too big or were they not feasible or did, you know, a pandemic happen or, but I try to look at it in terms of a longer timeline and then ask myself, okay, I do like I that. feel balanced? Because like with busy seasons or, yeah. you know, with academic semesters or with like all these seasons, you know, they ebb and flow. And it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Most of the time it's, it's factors out of your control that yeah. it's too bad. Your exam's coming up. You're studying for two weeks. You have no time. You can't right? you can't do much. And I, I do actually like that point of view of sort of, okay. In the parts that I can't control, that's okay. The parts that I can, what am I doing to sort of make the most of my time off? Most of and my like time that. off. And like you said, and encouraged taking that time off, yes. not just yes. plowing through. You get no. something to look forward to. You get to re, um, reintegrate that balance. You kind of get to ask yourself, okay, I used to like to paint by numbers and go to spin class and, you know, do X, Y, Z because like during the CP summer and now, okay, well, factors out of my control, you know, whatever the province says we're allowed to do and not right. do. All right. What, what do I have left? What do I want to kind of see? And I like how you created your own like reading schedule, like with schedule, but you know, like, oh, I like yeah. nonfiction in the morning. I like fiction in the evening. And this is what yeah. I like. And, you know, having those questions to yourself and asking yourself what you like. And I think that's fabulous. Yeah. And I'm trying to really sort of um, hone in this, I guess, routine and these habits so that when it does get busy again, I don't want to lose sight of that because um, it is really hard, as we've been saying, when it gets busy to sort of just not let yourself go, but sort of forget that you need to take care of yourself. Um, yeah. And that's that's a really hard thing to do. Um, so I'm trying to sort of regain that um, control, I guess, of, of putting myself um, still first and, and doing things for me, even when it may get extremely busy. Absolutely. Um, and just one final point on that. I would like to know what your thoughts are, but um, 
I heard from, I think it was like Cal Newport, who does a lot on deep work and also time management. And he's really big about time off. And, you know, you schedule your time, make the most of your time when you're working so that you can have the most um, kind of like deep fun, like when you're, you know, right. um, because if you think of us like knowledge workers, like athletes, you wouldn't expect an athlete to like go train for, you know, no. 24 hours a day, six days a week, you'd be like, no, you need rest. You need recovery. So knowledge workers, like we need to, you know, heal our tool, our brains, our, you know, spirit, our communication, you know, part right. of community, like our job is communicating. So if we don't take time to kind of, you know, recoup some of that energy. How are we supposed to be effective in our jobs? So when I start thinking about it like this, like we are like professional athletes, with our brains, then no, I'm like, totally. okay, it makes more sense. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. It is important. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So we have a student question and I, I like this one. Um, <laughs> do you regret uh, pursuing accounting or completing your CPA? <laughs> no, I do not. Bottom line. Um, it was hard. It was grueling. Um, but being where I am now, coming to the end of it, seeing that finish line, there was not a single regret in any of that. Um, as I said, trust the process where you may be feeling sort of overwhelmed or lost, or is this for me? Um, everyone's in that boat. It's a really um, challenging program, but you pushing yourself and getting through that is going to do more to prove to yourself that you can do anything than anything else. So um, I do not regret going through it. And if you're sort of on the cusp, I say, keep powering through. <laughs> yeah. All right. Knowing that this is going out to the interwebs, um, by the way, I heard an old person say that and I was like, I like that. I feel like <laughs> I will get interwebs. Uh, <laughs> um, what, um, what are your future plans or options or what are you considering like in theory and knowing that we are, oh gosh, I'm, I'm going to say we're nearing the end of a pandemic, but let's just say that we are, we are in new and interesting continued times. Um, right. what, what kind of things are you considering? I'm not really sure. I'm sort of just cruising on my path right now. Um, I am really enjoying my audit experience right now. I think I'm just sort of going to cruise, um, cruise down that path for a little bit. Let's try to try out some different clients, um, continue to take advantage of work from home where I can maybe explore a couple other different places, maybe, um, if, if we're allowed to sort of, I mean, within Canada by that. <laughs> um, and yeah, sort of just, I don't have any major plans. I'm sort of just seeing, um, I guess where, where my current path takes me, if I've exposed to any, uh, really interesting clients or anything that I sort of like, um, the way that their business or industry works, um, just sort of taking, taking it all in right now. What I think people don't really realize, um, and maybe they do, but I definitely didn't when I went through is I didn't realize as an auditor that I kind of got the ability to <laughs> work, um, as if I'm in all these different jobs while being in one company and having that like safe, secure, like knowledge base and support, but totally. I get to go like test out and yeah, I'm the auditor, but like, if anything, that means I get more access. Cause at what point am I going to be able to be like, Hey, what's your payroll? Hey, yeah. who's that? Like, totally. <laughs> what duties do they do? Like as part of your job, like it's your job to kind of go around and be nosy in these companies, right. which is it fabulous. Yeah, no, it is really sort of that interesting inside role and just you get exposure to so many different people and um, industries and jobs. And yeah, it's really, it really is sort of an interesting uh, inside, inside role. And people have found um, they don't really hold a lot back from auditors because <laughs> it's like, they're not paying you directly. So there's not like that client, there's a client-ish relationship, but there's not like that money value personal. exchange, yeah. personal. And so I remember being at this one company and this VP made a shit ton of money and his bonus was, is, is more than my, or his, what he paid on his bonus is more than my salary at Dell. Like it's a lot. Oh and goodness. I remember he was one of the most miserable people. And then he was like, I had the best time of my life. He finally opened up one day. He was like, I had the best time of my life. Um, articling, like it was so amazing. And I remember just being like, wow, um, interesting like I, I think what he meant by best time is likely not like you know the <laughs> the objective <laughs> best um but definitely that there's something to be said about um you know numbers on a page or numbers in a bank account um and titles and everything doesn't necessarily um translate one for one into personal happiness so that was a huge eye-opener that I don't think I would have seen had I been one of his employees like I totally. don't think that to his employees <laughs> No, that, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah, you sort of get that vulnerability almost. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> 
All right. Um, so you've already given a ton of good advice, fabulous advice um, for accounting students, broader speaking. Do you have any advice for current um, management learners? Anybody thinking about doing their bachelor of commerce in first or second year, perhaps? Um, I say do it. It is the most valuable um, experience that you can you can gain. And it really sort of opens doors in so many different directions. Um, I would say, yeah, it, whether Dallas specific or, or any university or wherever, um, having sort of a bachelor of management or commerce or whatever, it really is um, a very valuable sort of experience and learning and all the different courses and everything. It's, it's valuable to whether you go into directly business or whatever, or even just everyday life. Now, you know, a little bit about business or about how things work or finances. It's, it's really valuable for, um, for life and career. So I say, go for it, <laughs> go for it, have some fun. Yeah, exactly. Um, no. So your first co-op term was with KPMG. Yes. Second. Yes. Third. Yes. I stayed. <laughs> you stayed. Okay. Yes. So my question I typically like to ask is how did you know when it was time um, to move on from your last job? Right. So, hmm. so I don't know. I, I, I mean, yeah. I, I think I'm going to flip this around to, um, why did you choose to stay, um, with KPMG? Um, okay. I, I can answer the other one first as well. Ooh, I yeah, like yeah, I yeah, yeah. Spin on it. Um, yeah. maybe not personally, as we said, I've, I've sort of stayed in my job uh, where I am, but just in which, general, which I do, I want to highlight as one thing. Um, I think that's fabulous. I think that there's a reason that you stayed and I think, you know what I mean? And I think that right. not every path is the same. And, um, I think that that's fabulous that you did. So just no, no shame or no shade. Like, it's yeah, great. no. And, and it's only been a, a few years. It sounds like a while, but I think in total, it's been maybe, maybe three years or something, yeah. <laughs> which grand scheme of career. Yeah. It's not, it's not a crazy amount, but I think, um, in general for people sort of moving on careers, I would say whenever you stop learning, I think it's mm. time to move on when you feel that you've mastered something. I, I think it's time to sort of, okay, level up what, what's next that I can sort of tackle or when things start to become easy in the everyday, I think that's when it's sort of your, your personal time to, okay, how can I level up? How can I grow? How can I keep learning? Cause I think that's really important not to stay stagnant in your job. So that's my answer to that. Thank you. We, um, we did a podcast a few weeks ago, with Tammy, Laura, and I, Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one of the things that came up was, you know, asking, um, you know, what are your next career steps? And I asked, and um, I asked Laura this on purpose. And um, because she had told me a story about one of her former students who brought her up for lunch and interviewed her and was like, okay, well, like, what's next? Like, you know, uh, director, dean. And Laura's like, no, I'm like, I'm happy. She's like, the, the student was very confused. Like, well, like, don't you want to continue like going up? And kind of where we summarize this is both, it's awesome to recognize when you are in a good place and when you're really happy with that. And what's really unique to some roles is that you can grow and learn and change and be challenged within, and your job title never change. Or, you know, she went from, Laura was promoted um, last few years from senior instructor to university teaching fellow. Um, and when she was a uh, senior instructor and as she would continue to be a um, university teaching fellow, she continued to pick on different projects, you know, um, either teach different courses or within the same like job, right. you know, pivot and learn and grow. So um, one thing I wanted to highlight with you is that, um, and first for them and for us, is like, I, I am in one job stream and, you know, if I never take on a bigger leadership role, I still have leadership opportunities that challenge and stretch and grow. And it's up to me to find some of these challenges. If I don't feel, um, if I don't feel like I'm contributing in the way that I want to contribute. So I, you have to take some right. ownership too. It's not just this job title that will like deliver you. No, no, that's a really good point. I like that a lot too. Yeah. There's always going to be opportunities, always ways, ways to grow. And, uh, yeah, keep, keep yeah. learning. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So whether it's, you know, I guess I just wanted to get from that is sometimes there's those new opportunities that come with a job title change. And sometimes it's the opportunities that you make for yourself. And then maybe at a company when it's like, cause I know when I left uh, industry to go full-time teaching consulting, it wasn't an issue with my title. It was just an issue that there was no more like challenging work. The BP right. that used to funnel me some of his projects retired the year before. I 
try to kind of keep getting more stuff. And then finally I found myself teaching and teaching more and, you know, <laughs> basically being able to wrap up my job in two hours a day uh, right. that, you know, I was like, I'm just here for a paycheck. And in one hand, I'm very privileged and grateful. And on the other hand, I want to contribute. And if I have that opportunity to go do that, that's to go to do so I should go do that. So yeah, you are, no, exactly. you are wise beyond, beyond all <laughs> took me a few more years to figure that out. So kudos. <laughs> Well, thank you. All right. So within that, um, just wrapping up, one of the things that I like to ask all of my guests is how they define success. So Nicole Bain, what is your definition of success? In a general sense, general. However you want to take life. it. Um, I would say personally for me, success at the end of the day is ensuring that I'm happy that's number one success for me. Um, that's a really good question. I haven't. Um, so some people, some people have said that what their current definition is something and that they expect for it to learn and change and grow with that. Right. I, I definitely agree with that. I think my current state, I guess maybe just living through the pandemic and sort of taking it almost day by day on some days maybe it's a little bit more uh, sort of tunnel visioned at the moment of, of focusing on sort of that just keep swimming kind of mentality of um, whatever I'm doing, as long as I'm finding sort of joy in my every day and making sure that I'm okay and I'm happy, um, career, life, whatever. I think that's sort of my, um, my tunnel vision uh, definition of success at the moment. Um, I, haven't really I would say, I, no, I really like that because I don't feel like that's, I don't feel like that's tunnel vision at all. I think that that it's is general, right? Yeah. In general, like, Hey, those check-ins, Hey, am I happy? Hey, am I contributing? Hey, am I being challenged? Like yeah. asking, asking those questions. And if the answer is yes, then who's to say that that's not a successful life. Right. Cause I, I could say, okay, success means getting that million dollar paycheck, getting whatever, having these sort of more material mm -hmm. landmarks, but that doesn't sort of cover all aspects of life. Every different era of life. So I would say, yeah, my, my general overarching umbrella term is making sure at the end of the day, I'm finding joy in everything that I'm doing and I'm, I'm happy at the end of the day. Love it. Yeah. No, no, no better way than um, to define it that way, especially because like, if you can't be happy with 900,000, you're not going to be mm -hmm. happy with a million. If you're not exactly. happy with 90,000, you're not going to be happy with like 900,000. Uh, one of these students, one of our students was so shocked when, um, so this kind of came up during CPA one time and I didn't even ask, but she was like, I just want to be able to make enough money to be able to afford Starbucks every day. And that was like, she, and I was like, okay. And, but, and then she looked yeah. at my Tim Hortons and she was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 oh, this is hilarious. And I'm like, well, like, I'm like, not, not that you asked. And I'm like, but I choose to drink this. <laughs> That's really funny. I'm like, I'm, but it's okay. Like I'm part of my definition of success is being <laughs> able to, to choose and not, I just thought that was funny. Cause she was like, Oh, <gasps> that is really funny. And I think that actually comes back to sort of what we we're saying about the marks. It's not about the numbers. It's about how you feel. Yeah. And so I, I guess that really ties in nicely. It's not about the sort of number of of your income or, or how much your coffee is it's what you choose and what you feel every day so that's actually really interesting we started to the 360 yeah and I, I like the callback you know, kudos to you it's different yeah. and everybody's definition should be in my opinion um should be different it should be tailored because you know um I've seen it uh, and I've definitely lived it at times chasing after somebody else's definition of success um hitting it and being like why <laughs> why aren't right. I happy like I'm you know I have X metrics or whatever. Um, but if it's your definition and you're chasing and you're improving upon like something that's personal to you and you hit it, then that's, then that's success or even not hit it. Like you're working towards it. Right. That's I feel it. it. Yeah. Whatever it may be. Yeah. All right. Um, so I do have your contact information. I have your LinkedIn. It'll be um, linked below and your email. Yes. Um, would you be open to Dow students or grads or somebody reaching out and saying hi? Of course, as we said in the beginning, I'm a talker. I'm, I'm also all ears. I'm, I'm here to give advice and help. So of course, by all means, please reach out if you have any questions or even just want to chat about any, anything I talked about today or just anything in general, accounting, life, whatever. I'm, I'm totally open. Perfect. Thanks, Nicole. Yes. Awesome. Thanks so much.